So maybe you just watched the, the video about Hello World, um, which I recorded, uh, I guess it's telling me I recorded it two minutes ago. Uh, and what I mentioned then, it's still fresh in my mind, what I mentioned then was that one of the experiments, probably the first experiment you should do, is see what happens if you want to print out some text other than the words Hello World. And I'll leave it to you to try, you should still try that. If you're already here, pause the video, go try that. Um, and, uh, and maybe, you also got to the point, and I can, I, can give, I can spoil this for you, but it turns out that you're allowed to have more than one line of code in your program. And we'll, we're gonna spend quite a bit of the course eventually talking about what's called control flow. So what order does the code run when you run a program? Um, and you might also notice that we can actually say quite a bit about these programs without really you know, opening a book or learning about terminology. There is actually a lot happening. Uh, inside of these initial programs, a lot of stuff that we could describe with terminology, but that maybe wouldn't mean too much to us. And my hope is that once we get comfortable, you know, the, the basics of how to drive here, so where the gas pedal is and how to turn the steering wheel, then we can begin talking about stuff like how does an internal combustion engine work. So let's just keep going on maybe trying some initial experiments. So um, what I, before I do anything else, I'm going to scroll down a bit here. Um, uh, this is a program that now runs, it apparently prints out output three times. We can see here printf, printf, printf. Now you might be thinking to yourself, okay, so I guess print, maybe that has something to do with output. The f, okay, well that's not helpful. I mean, why do we need to call it printf? Uh, it turns out printf stands for print formatted, and I can't really give a good explanation about that either. What we're going to learn is that this was a language designed in the early 1970s, and people's... Um, to be diplomatic, sense of aesthetics was a bit different back then. And so we'll see through the semester, a lot of the design decisions that they made probably made sense to them then, but don't make any sense to us in 2020 and may not have made much sense to us in like 1990. Um, and that's one of the consequences of using a language that's this old. On the other hand, C, I mean, you might be complaining, well, why are we learning such an old language? What, well, yeah, okay. If it weren't for the C language, we wouldn't, this video couldn't exist, not just because it's a C course, but no videos. <laughs> At this point, the computer that you are running this on, I have no idea where in the world you're watching this, but the computer that you are, that you are watching this video on, it has an operating system, Windows or Mac or Linux, that's written in C. And the browser you're using to view the video is written in C. And all the web servers between you and the uh, wherever the video is being hosted on the internet are probably relying heavily on C code. Because it's only through languages like C that we actually have all the infrastructure that we need to have higher level, more pleasant modern languages. So we're going to have to get used to some of these idiosyncrasies. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to claim, and you should know better as the course proceeds than to just believe everything I say. Certainly, uh, when we work with code, the best way to know if a piece of code works is to run it. But I'm going to claim this code is already valid. And before we do any of these three tasks for this video, uh, maybe we should try compiling and running our code. Because remember, if we don't know that the code compiles and then we make some changes and, and it has an error, how do we know where the error occurred? We want to be able to scientifically find all of the errors in our code. We want to know when the error uh, originated and, and then how to fix it. So let's try compiling this. So we're going to maybe memorize this eventually. I guess I could go back to the command I just used. Um, but we'll try writing it out from scratch. GCC W all standard C11. And then I'm going to call this. So the name of my text file here is several lines dot C. So I'll call the program several lines. Usually I like to call the program the same thing as the dot C file. Although it's really important that the name you give the program that's compiled, the thing after the dash O, does not have a dot C in it. Um, that will upset the compiler. So .c is the name of your code, and then without the .c, that's the name of the finished program. So I'll try that. The compiler doesn't complain, and then I'll try running it. Now, one great thing you'll notice in our virtual lab platform here is instead of having to type the complete name of the program, you can give, you can start it off several, and then I'm going to press tab, and that means that it goes and tries to autocomplete for you. So there you go. It figured out that I meant several lines, and I print that. And you'll notice that it prints out three lines of output. And in fact, it prints out the first one, then the second one, and then the third one. So maybe without me having to tell you so, you might have deduced that regardless of what all this stuff means, once we get inside of this area here, the program runs from top to bottom. We, we run each line one at a time and then work our way to the end. Although maybe there's a question about what's going on with this. So why didn't this do anything? 
Clearly the compiler let this go. It didn't complain, so this must be valid C. So why didn't it do anything? Why does it just start with hello world, the stuff off of line 14? And that brings us to task number one. So we have to learn what a comment is. So generally speaking, when you write code, your goal is to tell the computer to do something. And of course, the philosophical goal that we all have as programmers is to save humans uh, time. Maybe we save ourselves time, maybe we save other people time, but the goal of programming is to, is to automate things to save time. Um, on the other hand, if we're writing code, and I mean right now we've got a piece of code that's, this file is 21 lines long. If we're writing code that does complicated stuff, so suppose you're writing a web browser or an operating system, there could be millions of lines of code. And sure, the point of programming is to tell the computer to do something. But who's doing the programming? Well, people, usually, and not just one. In, in many cases, you'll have teams of thousands of people all working on the same um, uh, project, which might have multiple files with huge millions of lines of code. Uh, and so it turns out that it's pretty important when you're programming not just to communicate with computers, but to communicate with people. And I don't just mean like me or other people on the team, I mean yourself. Even if you're writing a piece of code all by yourself, so independently like you would for the assignments in this course, it's really nice to be able to write notes in English. And so all programming languages that I've ever heard of at least have a feature called a comment. And a comment is a way of inserting arbitrary stuff into your code that is completely ignored by the language. And so in C, if you want to have a comment, you put two slashes at the beginning of a line. And so I could say this line prints the text CSC 111. Everything after the two slashes gets ignored. And you can see that in the editor here, it actually colors the lines green to show that they're comments. And we typically call a line that's um, behind the comment, a, it's been commented out. So when the line is commented out, the compiler completely ignores it. And you can see you can have the comment on the line by itself, or you could have the comment uh, after some actual code on the line. But in any case, anything after these two slashes gets completely ignored. And so you could use this to write notes to yourself. And you will notice as the semester progresses, I love this. I love writing comments. Um, not just to, to make conversation because I'm giving lectures to a machine this semester, but also because it lets me stay organized. I, I can, you know, structure my video around a nice shopping list, task one, task two, task three. And we'll see that the assignments work the same way. If your assignment is to perform a bunch of tasks in order, you could even write yourself a shopping list and then fill in each part with code as you go along. And so even though people often say, but I'm the programmer, I know what I'm doing. Yeah, right, you know, convince me of that when it's like 2.30 in the morning and you've been working on code for a few hours. Um, once you write, once you're programming for long enough, you realize how important it is to remind yourself what you're actually trying to achieve. So comments are one way to do that. And it's generally considered out there in the world, we don't care as much about that in an early point, like in a course like this, but out there in the world, uh, a good programmer should be writing comments to explain what their code does, because it might not be obvious in most cases what the code is doing. Although in some cases like this, description is stupid because um, it's sort of obvious what that line does. It prints out CSC 111. So you don't need to put a comment to explain obvious things, but anything that might be a bit confusing to you or to anybody else, it's good to throw in a comment, especially because if you know you leave the code for a few days and come back to it, you might have forgotten what it does. So having a description in English is helpful. Um, so normally I write my comments with these two slashes, which means everything on the line gets ignored. But C also lets you put comments across multiple lines. Um, and so let's put an example of one of those. So here's a comment that obviously spans multiple lines. When you have a comment that spans multiple lines, you could just put the two slashes before every line, or you're allowed to use this notation. So slash star, and then anything you want for as many lines as you want, and then star slash. Everything between the slash star and the star slash gets ignored, just like any other comment. You can also use the, whoops, you can also use the uh, slash star style of comment for single line comments, but maybe you can see why that's sort of annoying. Um, it's way easier for me at least to just use the two slashes. Um, now you shouldn't just take my word for it. Let's save the file and see what the compiler does. So I'll try compiling this again. It still doesn't complain. Just for the sake of um, playing devil's advocate here, let's see what happens if I remove this. Now this is not valid C code. The compiler has no idea what this is supposed to mean, but let's see what happens if we try compiling this. 
Okay, so it says, now we'll learn that what it's saying here is, okay, in several lines dot C on line 12, okay, so that's here, error, unknown type name this, what? Like, what is that supposed to mean? So what the compiler has no idea what it's doing here. It's just very confused. And when it gets confused, it says all sorts of weird random stuff. The way we should interpret this is, okay, go looking at line 12 and see if anything looks, um, looks like it's amiss. And yeah, this is obviously not C code, it's just English. So the compiler here doesn't know what to do because obviously if the code isn't inside a comment, it assumes it's supposed to know what that means, and it doesn't. Um, what we'll learn is that the best programmers in my experience are ones that are good at dealing with errors, not ones that have no errors in their code. There's this weird, I don't know, um, this, this weird thing that I see some people do where they brag about how they can write code with no errors. And it's like, yeah, okay, great, but um, it's sort of nice. I, I think a good programmer is somebody that writes code full of errors and fixes them quickly and without drama. Um, I think, in a sense, you become more battle-hardened the more errors you work with. If you never have an error in your code, you never learn how to fix broken code. And often when you're programming, you don't just have to write code yourself, you have to work with other people's code that could be broken. So keep that in mind. There's nothing wrong with having a compiler error. Um, it's all about knowing how to fix it quickly, uh, and, or efficiently. Some errors take longer to fix than others. Another thing you have to keep in mind is that, as we saw a minute ago, the errors the compiler actually gives you can be sort of meaningless because even the compiler can get confused. And so there isn't some deeper magic to this. It's not like you eventually learn what these weird random messages mean. There are lots of error messages I get now where even I have no idea what they're supposed to actually mean. The, the idea is this gives you a clue, like look on line 12, look at the word this, and you might have to do some, some of your own deduction to figure out what could be causing the problem. In any case, I fixed the problem, so we'll compile and run. So I compile. Okay, now the compiler's not complaining. I'm gonna try running again. Okay, um, I'm gonna type clear to just clean stuff up a bit. Um, and before we do task two, I wanna do one more thing about, uh, talk about comments one more uh, way, which is one thing that comments are really useful for is if you're debugging your code or if you're just testing stuff out, you can use comments to selectively test out bits of your code without having to delete stuff. So suppose I, I want to know what would happen if I got rid of this line. But then I'm also scared because I actually like this line and I want to keep it. I don't want to accidentally lose it forever. So I could delete the line, but I could also just make it a comment temporarily, which means I can always go back and save it if I need it later. And if I do this, we'll see what happens if I do this. Um, so we'll run this piece of code. And we can see that the compiler completely ignored everything on the line. It did not interpret that as being a print statement because it was in a comment. And that's one of the, the greatest uh, uses of comments. I know I, I can keep telling you how useful it is to write little notes to yourself, and many of you won't believe me until October, but this feature of comments is one that people usually find quite appealing even early on. The ability to use them to selectively run bits of code. I could also do something like use a multi-line comment to comment out entire blocks of my code, like this. And we'll save that and try that just to see what it does. Uh, and so that's pretty useful. We call that commenting out a piece of code. So if a piece of code appears in a comment, which means it gets ignored, we say that code is commented out. Okay, so that's task number one. So the implication of task number one is that now, we, now that we have the ability to write bits of English inside of our code, we should do that all the time. And the first place we should do that is at the beginning of every one of our code files, we should have the name of the file, and certainly all the, the names of all the people involved in writing the file and the date that it was created or last modified. For complicated programs, I don't know if this program is that complicated, but um, for more complicated programs and for assignments and things, it's also a good idea to write a brief description of uh, what the program does. So, I mean, this is just an example from a lecture. That's the best I can come up with. Um, and you, you may notice if you end up on a co-op term doing programming and even in mechanical engineering or biomedical or civil or all the ones without computer in their name, you often end up programming on co-op terms. You will discover if you have an employer that expects you to program, they usually have a sort of house style. Like they expect that, that every file has a comment at the beginning in a certain format or something. And of course, it's easy to learn whatever style they require. They might require you to write, you know, author, colon, B bird or something like that. So uh, that's one thing we basically require in, in, bas in, in every context in this course is have a comment at the beginning of your file with your name and the name of the file and the date. 
The reason why that's useful, I mean, in a bigger setting, if you're working in a big team somewhere, is of course it's nice to know who wrote a piece of code. It's also useful to have things like names and dates on everything you produce, not just code. Everything in your entire career, it's good to make sure your name and the date is visible because if ever there's a dispute over who owns something, or who wrote something or who has the rights to something, having a record that you wrote it is pretty helpful. And you might notice this semester, this obnoxious practice I've had to adopt of putting my name on all the course material and saying copyright Bill Bird. That's because the university has told me that apparently now that we have online classes, there is a bunch of copyright thieves or something. I don't know. Um, and so they're saying, again, as a defensive measure, it's good to put your name on stuff you produce or you might end up not owning it at some point in the future. So what's task number two? Task number two, figure out what this does. So maybe by now, if you stare at this for a while, you might agree that if I want to print some output back to the user, and I guess I'll, I'll rerun this in its uh, original form. Okay, there we go. So it, it's still, we'll clear that and then run it again so we can stare at the output. It's got three lines of output and they come in the order that I provide them in the program. And I use this thing printf, whatever that is, and we'll, we're getting there. I use this thing printf to tell the program to output some text. And that's great. And clearly I can print whatever I want, CSC 111, fall 2020. But every single time I put this in there and we should be a bit curious about what's going on there. So it's something I need to have, okay, but it's inside the quotation marks. So, well, I guess the first question, being scientific, is what happens if I get rid of it? And, I mean, if you ever have a question like this, the very first thing you should do is just try it. You can't break your computer uh, by writing, by experimenting with code. Even if you could break a computer by experimenting with code, remember that all the stuff you do in our virtual lab environment is happening on our virtual lab computer. And you can't really break those. Trust me, I've, I've spent a long time trying to break them. You can make them run slowly, but you can't break them. And so experimentation is free. And so if you want to know what something does, just try it, see what happens. And um, there's, a, there's a certain game you can end up playing where you see how badly you can make the compiler complain about stuff. Th there are cases where you can upset the compiler so much that it gives you pages and pages of errors. If you find a really uh, hilarious case of that, send me, send me a message because I love seeing those. Um, okay, so I've tried removing that backslash n. I save the file, we'll try compiling and running it. Huh. Hello world, CSC 1, okay, so it forgot to press enter. Before, it pressed enter between hello world and CSC 111, and now it doesn't. Interesting. And I think as scientists, we can pretty much already form a hypothesis here, which is, okay, so I got rid of that backslash n, and now the computer doesn't press enter between the two lines. So I'll bring it back in. I guess I'll save my file first. And okay, now it presses enter again. So my hypothesis is this is some way of, of telling it to press enter. And I guess the next experiment I should do is, okay, so apparently the backslash n means press enter. Can I put the backslash n anywhere other than just at the end? So I'm gonna put it somewhere completely arbitrary. How about right here? Hello, space w backslash n earled. I'll save. I guess I'm realizing now, I keep saying I'm saving my file. The way you save the file is you go to you can go to the file menu and click save. Um, I'm doing it by pressing Control S. Uh, I've had to learn some hotkeys to make these videos a little bit less painful. So uh, compile that, run that, and we can see that I've got this backslash n after the w, and sure enough, it presses enter right there. And so I think and and keep in mind, nowhere in the video did I tell you what backslash n did. We've just experimented with it. We've deduced what it does by playing with it. And my comment earlier about making bread or driving a car, I think, uh, is pretty well exemplified by this. You can read books about programming all day long. They're really useful. There are lots of reasons it's good to know terminology related to a language. Um, on the other hand, the best way to build an internal model about uh, of things like this, to, for your brain to wrap around what programming is, is just to play around with things. It doesn't matter necessarily what we call this thing. It matters for now that we know what it does. Once we know what it does, it's not too difficult to learn what it's called. And it turns out that backslash n is, is called a new line. It is a way of telling the program to go to a new line. And every time that we see a backslash n inside this text, so I'm going to put it over and over again here just to be obnoxious. Every time we see a backslash n, a substitution is performed. The compiler performs a substitution for us. 
Every time it sees a backslash n, it substitutes in the equivalent of pressing enter. And so we'll run this, and we'll see it presses enter over and over again. Um, and we'll see that substitutions, it turns out, are pretty relevant to everything that printf does. And I'm going to undo all that because that's obnoxious. Uh, and uh, I guess maybe some of you are, may already be thinking ahead and wondering, well, wait a minute, though. What if I wanted to actually print out backslash and then n? So every time a backslash n shows up inside of this text, it gets turned into a, a new line. But what if I actually want to print out a backslash? So it turns out we have to solve that with, with a sort of, um, I don't know if it's, it's a bit of a workaround, but basically what I want is this. So here is a backslash. And I want to put a backslash right here. Okay, can I do this? Well, let's just try that and see what happens. And it says the compiler doesn't like it. I try running this. I want to print out a backslash. And the compiler says something, but it doesn't say error. And what's interesting about this is if the compiler doesn't say error, then it did compile the program. But if you get a warning, that's a sign that something might not be working properly. Let's try running this. And here it says, here is a backslash. And then uh, it just sort of falls apart. It doesn't print out what I wanted. Uh, and I'm going to actually put another line down here to prove my point. Here's some more text. OK, so we'll try this, and we'll get the same warning again. And don't worry if you get a warning like this. Really, if you get a warning, all you need to worry about is, is uh, you know, what's causing it. Uh, and there are some rare cases where, actually, there are certain warnings where the compiler is, is, um, doesn't need to be complaining. Maybe it's, it's being a bit melodramatic, and we can ignore the warning. Um, and we can see, here's a backslash and then just nothing. It doesn't know what to do. So basically what's happening is, because the compiler is trained to say, every time I see a backslash and n, substitute that for a new line, it turns out that every time it sees a backslash and then anything, it wants to do a substitution. Um, and so if we want to print an actual backslash, we have to put two of them, backslash, backslash. Now that's a bit weird. And for those of you that were following the video up to this point, I don't blame you if this seems like a little bit out of left field. So what we're doing here is the compiler is, it believes that a backslash means you're about to tell me to do something special. And so it then says, well, what do you want me to do? Backslash n means new line. Actually, it turns out I can show you another example of one. There's backslash t. Backslash t means uh, it's the equivalent of pressing tab on your keyboard. So I'll put that at the very beginning, and we can see the effect. Uh, and then, oh, I forgot to put a backslash n at the end of this line. It's hard to see the effect if, there's, if our lines aren't separated. So here is a backslash. I get backslash, backslash. Here, I can see it did the equivalent of pressing tab. And I used backslash t to get that substitution. So the backslashes give us a way of telling the compiler to produce unconventional things, things we can't just type in. Um, one thing, maybe if you've already experimented with this, you might have tried, that we ought to try ourselves is, why can't I just put a new line inside of the quotes? Couldn't I write something like this? And you can maybe see the formatting's already a bit messed up, so maybe the, um, even the editor already knows what the punchline's going to be here. So if I do this, if I say, I want to print out three lines, I'll just put all three lines inside of this printf. So we'll try that. And we can see the compiler is not happy about this at all. Um, so it begins with a warning. And it says, I, don't, I have a feeling something's wrong here. And then it just throws a tantrum. It, it doesn't know what to do. It gets to the end of this line. It says, where's the other quotation mark in the bracket? And then everything just falls apart. So it turns out that when you have one of these printf things, you have to make sure that the entire thing is on one line, including all of this stuff here. So we'll get back to where we were a minute ago. Um, and so we need the backslash n to have a way of telling it to press enter. And it's performing a substitution. And there actually are a variety of other ones. The only ones we tend to care about in the course are backslash n and maybe occasionally this one. And we don't usually even need backslash t. Um, there is also one you could use. Uh, I'll show this off. Um, you might notice that there are some other characters that aren't easy to use. Like, for example, what if I want to print out a quotation mark? Well, OK, here's a quotation mark. There it is. Oh, whoops. Well, the editor didn't like that. Here's a quotation mark. Um, and we can see it's even hard for me to actually type that in. So here's a quotation mark. There's the double quote. And then, wait, where does the text end? 
is this the text I want to print out, or is this the text I want to print out? You might be able to forgive the compiler for being a bit um, confused here, because how does it know that this quotation mark is something you want to print and not the end of the text? Because every other place we see a quotation mark, that's what it is. And the way we get around that is we use a backslash, just like with anything else. If we, print, if we write backslash quotation mark, that's telling the compiler, no, no, this is a real quotation mark. Actually print this out. So I'll show that off. And there it is. There's a quotation mark. Oops, I guess I forgot. We can see that the next line gets mashed into the same line. That's a sign that I forgot my backslash n at the end of that line. So just to polish the example off, we'll try that again. And so now we can print out all these special characters, backslashes, quotation marks, new lines, even tabs. So we understand maybe that printf is using a substitution system that allows us to print unusual things. And there actually are a wide variety of other unusual things that we're not going to need in this course that printf is capable of printing. So what's task three? Task three is talking about a different kind of substitution. So uh, what I want to do is I want to do some arithmetic. And the next set of videos will talk about this, and the first set of labs will talk about this in great detail. But basically, I want to do makes the C language do some actual work for me. So I'm going to write, okay, 187 times 111 is, and the way we do arithmetic in C is, um, well, we, we, use an, we use the same notation you would use on a calculator. So, you know, the, this is the multiplication operator. But you might look at this and say, if I write this, it's just going to print this as text. Because obviously, anything I put in the quotes, it prints back out. And that's correct. So we'll, we'll run it to prove the point. But if I run this, it just prints out 187 times 111 is, and then just whatever I typed in as text, because that's what it was. So how do I make it actually do that arithmetic? I want it to actually perform the operation. So what I have to do is I have to separate the text that I'm printing from the uh, C's ability to perform arithmetic. And I'm going to use a different kind of substitution. So, the th so first I have to think about what do I want here? Well, I want a number. I want to figure out the result of this expression, this numerical expression. And then I take the expression out and I, I put a comma after my quotation mark and I write the expression like this. And you might notice even the formatting is reflecting that this is being interpreted differently now. And then I tell printf where to put the numerical result. So here I'm doing the arithmetic, 187 times 111, and I tell printf with percent %d, percent %d says do a substitution, so d unfortunately stands for decimal as far as I can tell. Percent %d means go and print out the value I gave you as a decimal number, which isn't too surprising, I guess. It's, it is a number in base 10. Um, and so I'll, I'll run this, and then I want to do one more example to maybe show off what I really mean by this. Um, so I run this. 187 times 111 is this number. You can check this yourself on the side if you want to. Uh, and so what I've done is I've, I've told printf, okay, print out 187 space T-I-M-E-S space 111 space I-S space, oh, percent %d. Okay, so whenever it sees a percent %d, it goes to the list of things after the quotation mark and it grabs the next result. It evaluates the entire thing, so it goes, it, it reduces it down to one number and then it puts that into the appropriate place uh, inside the printed text. And so I'll show this off with some more arithmetic. So I'll say um, 6 plus 10 is this number, and then 17 plus 187 is this number. So we'll do two substitutions. The first one is 6 plus 10, and I'm not in any mood to do that arithmetic myself, so I will type it in as 6 plus 10, and 17 plus 187, is over here. So what I do if I want printf to print out several different numbers is first I make up the string of text I want and I put as a placeholder percent %d in you know, all the places I want the numbers to be printed out. And then after the piece of text I provide all of the numbers that I want to print out in order. So the first percent %d becomes the first thing in the list, the second percent %d becomes the second thing in the list. Um, and by default, as we'll see in the next lecture, by default, if I use this percent %d, which we, for most of the course, we default to percent %d. There are other, other types of substitutions we can use. This is all what's called integer arithmetic. So it's whole numbers. If I have a number with a decimal point and something after it, then integer arithmetic won't do the trick. But we'll see that in the next lecture. The goal for today was to talk about printf and its various uh, forms of substitutions. Um, and then one last thing I want to observe. This is actually surprisingly important for later. Um, 
what I put over here can be as simple or as complicated as I want. So I'm gonna write, I'm just gonna write the number is. I wanna try a few variants of this. So if I want to, okay, it pasted that in, that wasn't me. If I want to, I could just put any number I want here. I don't have to do any arithmetic. And I'll verify this by compiling and running it. The number, so it prints out all this other garbage from before. The number is six. I could print out something a little bit more complicated, six times 10, or I could print out something, a fully uh, parenthesized expression, like six times 10 plus 187 um, divided by two. And I guess we'll try that. I, I'm a bit curious now to know what that is. So it's apparently 591. And we'll notice one key thing that we'll see in this course is that uh, C doesn't care when you need a number, whether it's just a single number by itself or whether it's the result of some complicated arithmetic expression. And we'll begin talking about not only how do we print out arithmetic, because you might have noticed if this is all C could do, we could just use a calculator all semester. Not only how to print out numbers, how to store them, how to manipulate them, how to actually do real work with real data uh, in the next sequence of videos.